Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 5 on Heredity. This is video number 17 and the last one in our little, sim, uh, little mini series on polypeptide synthesis. In this case we're going to look at some of the interactions between the genes and the environment. As with the other videos we've looked at up to this point, we are in this sort of frame of modeling the process of polypeptide synthesis, but this time we want to assess how genes and the environment affect the phenotypic expression. So in order for us to do this, we need to make sure that we've got an understanding of the link between the sequence of bases in DNA and the production of a protein. So that's what protein synthesis is, and we've done a lot of that, so hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, to be able to look in general terms about environmental influence and then some situations specifically which may uh, contribute to the uh, promotional inhibition of gene expression. So let's get into it. We've talked about this whole process of DNA um, recording the information or storing the information in the sequence of bases and the production of polypeptides in the ribosome as requiring a transcription process to read the information that's in the DNA and then a translation process to turn that sequence of bases into a code for a sequence of amino acids that produces a protein. Now we've done this by talking about the difference between genotype, which is the, the information that's contained within the DNA, and the phenotype, which is the actual physical expression of that um, information. Now this is similar, I guess, to um, a, an analogy that's used quite often um, of a computer. So a computer has a program, a particular type of a series of instructions that it can run, and that's kind of like its genotype. The phenotype then would be um, what is actually running, what programs are actually running. And that can be influenced by the determination of any operator as to what programs are going to execute. So there may be a lot of information that's present, a lot of different types of programs that are part of any computer system, but an operator or an inbuilt um, set of sequences may be what is used to trigger um, the actual running of certain types of programs. We know there's programs that run in the background and there's programs that are chosen uh, by the operator. So this is kind of a little bit of an analogy. Remember, analogies are, are never perfect. They're just a way to help you understand um, how something else might work. So the information is all there, but there are certain triggers for when certain programs are actually going to be run. The genotype then is this genetic makeup, the actual information, the sequence of bases that are in the DNA. The phenotype is those physical observable traits, the ones that are actually being produced. So we've talked about um, the fact that we can extend our understanding of phenotypes to physical appearance. So that can be uh, color of flowers or leaves, height of plants or people, um, hair color, eye color, all those sorts of things. But we also know that the phenotype is the specific sequence of amino acids that are present in the construction of a polypeptide. So if then the base sequences in the DNA are equal to the genotype and the amino acid sequence in the uh, ribosome are the phenotype, how is it that the environment can actually change this? We know that the genetic information is pretty much fixed. We we haven't explored um, mutation in a lot of detail yet, but we do know that that is a way that the genetic information can change. So when we talk about the genetic information being fixed, it isn't, but it mostly is. The mistakes that are made during replication are um, not insignificant, but on the scale, um, they don't usually make a lot of difference. Occasionally they may. But what can happen is that the phenotypic expression can change on the basis of a number of different types of factors. And it's these different factors that we want to look at in this video. So some of the general examples that you can look at um, are uh, everywhere. And obviously it's worth making a small list of these and they'll be more useful, I guess, to you once we look at Mendelian genetics in a little bit more detail later on. But there is a gene for melanin, which is about uh, the pigmentation in the skin um, that is generally responding to sunlight, the UV radiation. And so if you never go out in the sun, then that's not going to have a chance to activate. That's an environmental impact. 
muscle development. You may have the capacity to be quite muscle bound to develop um, really well defined muscles. But if you don't exercise, if you don't work those muscles in the right ways, then you're not going to get that muscle definition. Plants may have genes for certain heights, but if they don't get enough water, if the soil quality is poor, they may not grow. One interesting flower um, study is hydrangeas. Interestingly enough, hydrangeas are affected by soil pH. And they're kind of like litmus spit in reverse. That is, you may remember from your junior science days that um, litmus comes in two varieties, red and blue. Blue is for base, red is for acid. Hydrangeas tend to be the other way around. They tend to be blue, produce blue flowers if they are in a acidic soil and more pinkish purple flowers if they are in a, a basic soil. So they're kind of litmus but in reverse. And you can actually change the colour of hydrangeas by changing the pH of the soil. Don't do it too much if you have hydrangeas because you can also um, stop them from growing at all. Uh, twin studies are very common. Uh, there's, there's more and more twin studies. Obviously, we can't subject twins to different environments to see what happens. There's an ethical problem with that. But we can study twins that have been separated, that have been raised in different environments, and to see what similarities and differences there are between two individuals who, uh, if they're identical twins, share the same genetic information. And the little Himalayan rabbit that we've got um, on display here is an interesting one. He has little little dark extremities. The dark the darker color draws the heat. So we know that that white reflects heat, and the dark the black color absorbs the heat. So you can see he has that on his um, extremities, so that it reduces uh, heat losses. And in fact, if we warm up um, these little Himalayan rabbits, so that they're in a slightly more uh, warmer environment than they might otherwise be, the black uh, fur doesn't develop. So it's definitely something that's affected by temperature or external temperature. This is what we're talking about when we talk about the effective environment on phenotype. Are there actually things, factors in the environment um, that can have an influence or perhaps an overriding influence on what would otherwise develop on the basis of the genetic information itself? But there's another level here too. And that is, we've talked really about the external environment. What's happening outside of me? Um, what sort of food have I put into my mouth? How much water? How much exercise have I done? All of those sorts, how much sunlight have I got? Am I in a cold environment or a warm environment? All of those sorts of things are external uh, factors, but there can be some internal ones too. When we look at internal factors, we can actually look at what's happening either at the level of the DNA itself uh, at the messenger RNA that's being produced, or even if there's a suppression of the production of that messenger RNA, and even that process of transcription to translation and post-polypeptide uh, post -polypeptide production. Try saying that five times quickly. So we're going to look quickly at each of these, and I think it's probably worth exploring a few of these in a little more detail. It's a great diagram in the um, Nelson Biology and Focus book, which kind of looks at a couple of these areas of where um, factors in the environment or in, in what we might call the internal environment of the cell, sometimes the internal environment of the nucleus, can actually have an impact on what's happening, uh, or at least what what happens in terms of the expression of the polypeptide once it reaches the ribosome. The first thing I want to have a, a quick talk about are operons. Operons are basically groups of genes. So now we're looking at uh, not just uh, a promoter region and a gene sitting in behind it, but maybe a couple of genes and the genes all work together. They kind of get switched on or switched off together. Um, the LAC operon is one of the ones that's been studied quite uh, extensively. Um, and the LAC operon uh, is a, a particular set of genes that are present in bacteria that respond to the presence of lactose. Uh, this, is, this is often a, a, a negative kind of a system because usually there's a repressor that bonds or binds to that region in the DNA that actually stops these genes from being expressed. Now, the repressor will actually interact with lactose. So if lactose is present, um, it sort of forms a complex with the repressor, which actually stops the repression, which actually means that the um, RNA polymerase can actually get in and produce 
the required messenger RNA, which is going to allow those, those enzymes to be produced. So the presence of lactose means you want to be able to break down the lactose, which means you need enzymes to be able to do that. So that increase in the lactose allows uh, for that particular thing to happen. A methylation is uh, the addition of CH3 group. So a methyl group is a CH3 group. Uh, CH3 groups uh, increase the density. Uh, and if you think about DNA kind of uh, in chromosomes, we can't usually see it. And that's usually because the DNA is wound tightly around uh, proteins called histones. Uh, the, the presence of methylation can actually tighten that up, can increase the density and make it hard for the RNA polymerase to get in and read um, the template and produce the messenger RNA. Acetylation has kind of the opposite effect that's like acetic acid, so CH3, C double O group, which adds in, actually expands because of that type of molecule, it actually expands uh, a little bit, so that decreases the density, which actually makes some of the um, regions of the DNA a little more easy to reach. Uh, mRNA modification can also happen uh, either through alternate splicing, the removal of some introns, for example, or through the production of micro um, RNA. Micro RNA is kind of little teeny tiny pieces and they can actually interact with the messenger RNA itself or they can even um, kind of be transported with it and um, change some of the processes that are happening during the translation stage. Uh, and then of course there's post polypeptide production. Um, and this is like sugar on donuts. So the easiest way to think about this is um, when you, if you uh, have seen donuts being produced. The donut mixture basically goes into the oil and the donut gets produced. So the donut comes out, it's a, it's a perfect donut. But then afterwards, uh, the donut often gets dipped in a sugar cinnamon kind of a uh, mix. And that coats the outside of the donut with, with sugar and cinnamon. And that's kind of what happens with certain types of polypeptides. They have the right sequence of amino acids. They can fold up into the right structures, but they need the addition of something like sugars in order for them to activate uh, the specific types of chemical processes that they're going to be involved in. So sometimes it's, it's actually the presence or absence of those chemicals in the environment that can um, inhibit or facilitate the... Um, function of proteins. So there's lots of areas where the environment, both external and internal, can have an impact on the expression of genes and also the production of uh, polypeptides. This has been a big section. I know each of these videos has been very long, so I hope you'll just start and stop them, have a look at little bits and pieces, increase your knowledge, and obviously go into a little bit more detail with your texts in order to uh, deepen your understanding. Thanks for watching.